Hi, my name is Michelle Sneed, and I'm a hydrologist with California Water Science Center U.S. Geological Survey in Sacramento, California. And today I'm going to talk about land subsidence in the San Joaquin Valley, specifically along the Delta Mendota Canal, where there's been some problems associated with subsidence. This first slide shows a photo that's very famous for land subsidence studies. It's Joe Poland, and he's using a telephone pole or a power pole to illustrate where the land surface was in 1925, where this sign is, 1955, and where he's standing in 1977. Almost 30 feet of land subsidence has occurred at this location during that time period, which is southwest of Mendota. And today I'm going to talk to you about a slightly different area that we were surprised to find subsidence when we were actually looking uh, for subsidence in these historical areas, including where Joe Poland is standing here in Mendota. So I'd like to start with a summary of how the results of the study turned out. And what we found were 1,200 square miles subsided in the northern San Joaquin Valley area. And this area was bounded by Mendota on the south, Merced on the north, Madera on the east, and Los Banos on the west. The subsidence is occurring at rates of ranging from about a half inch a year to almost a foot a year over a two year period from 2008 to 2010. And the Bureau of Reclamation and the Department of Water Resources have been doing surveys in this area that indicate these rates have continued through 2013. The problem with subsidence in this area is that there's a lot of water conveyance infrastructure that's getting impacted by the subsidence. This includes the Delta Mendota Canal, which was the original study area that we were working on, also the California Aqueduct, the Eastside Bypass, which is the most important flood control channel east of the San Joaquin River, the San Joaquin River itself, actually in the restoration area, and many local canals are being impacted by the subsidence. The subsidence is permanent, meaning that um, even if we stopped pumping so much groundwater uh, and groundwater levels actually started to recover, the land surface will not come back up. So it's permanent. Now, as I just mentioned, this subsidence occurred when groundwater levels declined to historically low levels as a result of pumping. Another really important uh, summary aspect of the study was that the place that we were looking for subsidence was not really where we found it. So the recent subsidence is about 25 miles northeast of the historical maximum where Joe Poland was standing in the previous slide. And what we've really found is that we need long-term monitoring of groundwater levels and subsidence to detect and track groundwater conditions to help with decision support. Because when the subsidence stopped in the 80s, and I'll go through a little bit of that, we moved resources to other issues in, throughout California because subsidence was essentially arrested. We turned our heads for 40 years, and then when we turned back around, we found that we these very fast rates of subsidence. Uh, Long-term monitoring would help us sort of avoid those kinds of surprises. So just a few facts about the Central Valley, of which the San Joaquin uh, Valley is the southern half of the Central Valley. It's very important to California, and it's large. It takes up the center part of our state, 20,000 square miles or so. About 250 crops are grown here, and they're worth about $17 billion a year. So very important for California's economy. It's also important to feed the nation. We feed about 25% uh, of food that feeds the nation comes from the Central Valley. So it's a very big contributor to our nation's food. Um, and only about 17% of the irrigated land is in the Central Valley. So while 17% of the irrigation uh, occurs, of the irrigated land is in the Central Valley, we're producing about 25% of the table food. And another interesting statistic is that 20% of all of the groundwater pumpage in the nation occurs in our Central Valley aquifer system. So a little background on how subsidence work works in the San Joaquin Valley. There are many kinds of subsidence, and there are principally two kinds in California. One is the kind you hear about in the Delta, 
And that's really a shallow process that is unrelated to what we're talking about in the San Joaquin Valley, which is a deep process. It's aquifer system compaction that results in land subsidence. And this compaction is concentrated in the fine grain deposits, the aquitards. And the reason that these fine grain deposits, especially clay, are different is because they're platy minerals. And when they are laid down originally, they're laid down in random orientations. So these, these platy minerals, you can think about them like pancakes. And they're laid down in these random orientations. But when we lower groundwater levels, we lower the pressure inside these grains. If you see on the left here, this is before subsidence. This is how they're laid down. Random orientations, lots of water in between the grains to store water. But when we start to lower groundwater levels and we lower pressure in between these grains, lower the pore pressure, that's the pressure that the water is exerting on the grains, keeping them apart, what happens is the grains actually start to rearrange themselves into more like a stack of pancakes. And you can see there's a lot less room in a stack, between a stack of pancakes for water to be stored than in randomly oriented ones. So clays are the big player in aquifer system compaction. And as you can see here on the left, this is just before groundwater levels really start to decline. And on the right, you see that those clay grains have rearranged themselves, and now that clay unit is thinner, and it results in land subsidence at the surface. Now, that level at which these grains rearrange themselves, we call that the pre-consolidation stress. And it, and it tends to be the previous lowest groundwater level, or at least that's what we generally use as our first cut to estimate what the pre-consolidation stress is, the historically lowest groundwater level. And the result is you have reduced storage capacity. So as I mentioned, the subsidence is largely permanent, and uh, so these grains will not go back into random orientations, even if water levels come back up. Well, why do we care about land subsidence? Well, we care about it really under two kind of categories. One is flood protection and infrastructure damage. So water conveyance systems and other infrastructure get damaged from subsidence because it's happening at different rates in different locations. If the whole San Joaquin Valley was subsiding at the same rate in the same way, then nobody would really care. But it's this sort of differential subsidence that's happening, different amounts of subsidence in different places that really damages um, canals, roads, railways, uh, pipelines, bridges. Anything that crosses these areas of differential subsidence can get damaged. And canals are particularly sensitive because in California, we try to use gravity as much as possible to move water. And gravity means that you need to have every point downstream on the canal needs to be at a lower elevation than every point upstream, or you need pumps to pump it uphill. So we rely a lot on gravity, which means canals are built at very specific elevations and very specific relative elevations. So if you start to lower one part of a canal, then all of the downstream parts of that canal are impacted by the subsidence upstream. Other problems we get are, uh, and this results essentially in reduced conveyance capacity. That's probably um, the most cited problem with land subsidence in canals because we can't push as much water as we used to. There's also reduced freeboard, and freeboard is essentially the distance between the water surface and anything that crosses the water surface, bridges or um, uh, roads, anything like that that crosses. Uh, you know, usually if you stand over a bridge and you look over the bridge, you see water flowing under the bridge. Well, when you have subsidence, sometimes now the water is running into the bridge, uh, which will um, damage the br bridge's integrity and start to erode and things like that. Uh, for lined canals, we start to get water to come over the top of the concrete liner sometimes if it's misaligned because of subsidence. 
Water will go over the top of the liner and erosional problems will, will occur uh, subsequent to that. With unlined canals, we have uh, deposition and erosional problems. So if, if you can imagine subsidence is, is coming this way, the water's supposed to flow this way, it's much steeper than it, than it was before the subsidence. So it's steeper so it'll erode, and then as it tries to go uphill, as it's continuing down the canal, it will deposit sediment. So we have those kinds of problems too. Uh, here in the upper right, we have a photo of a well in the San Joaquin Valley. It was drilled in 2010, and when it was drilled, they painted the top foot of it orange so that uh, tractors and other farm equipment, you can see it's in a vineyard here, uh, wouldn't hit the well. Uh, however, two years later, two additional feet of that well casing were sticking out of the ground. So we're looking at about a foot a year at this location. This uh, photo here is along the Delta Mendota Canal, and it's a buckling in the liner, the concrete liner. And while we can't say for sure that this is a result of subsidence, this is an area along the Delta Mendota Canal that has had uh, serious issues with subsidence. They've had to do a lot of uh, infrastructure retrofit fit in this area, so it's kind of in a suspicious location. The other category really is natural resources, and I went through that in the last slide about how we get reduced aquifer storage capacity and that we can never get that back. And of course, uh, you can imagine that wetlands and rivers flow downhill, and they are in the low spots in the land. So as we are differentially lowering the land surface, then the wetlands and riparian corridors may get uh, moved around, so rivers may shift course. Uh, aquatic ecosystems that depend on those uh, will also have to, to modify. Uh, and then, of course, we get restricted land uses um, um, based on those kinds of problems. These are uh, just a couple of photos um, uh, actually near that buckle in the canal that I showed you in the last slide. Uh, on the left is the Delta Mendota Canal at what's called Check Station 18. Check Station is really just a, an infrastructure on a canal that helps maintain the water surface elevation and the flow in a canal. And when this was originally built, this top and bottom photos are both of the same area, uh, you can see that this is a double-decker structure here. When it was originally built, it was not double double-decker structure. They had to build it up so that they could maintain the elevation of the water surface uh, at a certain elevation in this canal. So they had to build up the infrastructure. This is just a close-up of the gates showing that they had to add on this, this top gate uh, uh, part. So they had to add on sections to these gates so that this check structure could continue pushing the same amount of water. So the Delta Mendota Canal is a federal canal, and they have the resources to put into the canal to build up the infrastructure to do the mitigation that's necessary to keep the water, the flow capacity near design capacity. Okay, so this is a, in a, this is a location, or this canal is a place where you know, federal money is, is backing infrastructure improvements to keep up with subsidence. On the right, this, this canal is called the Outside Canal, and it's just a few miles north of the Delta Mendota Canal at Check 18 here, so they're only a few miles apart. And here you can see that there's these sidewalls built up on this bridge here. They weren't there when the bridge was first designed. They had to build up the sidewalls to keep the water off of the road. Um, this whole bridge is actually going to be um, torn down and redone because it's starting to erode uh, the bridge structure, um, so it's, it needs to be replaced. So this is an area where they have lost freeboard. This is the freeboard I was talking about, that you should see the water going under the bridge, and si instead you see the water going into the bridge. So how do we measure subsidence? Well, Historically, we measured uh, subsidence, elevation, and elevation change using benchmarks in networks, first by spirit leveling, as shown here, uh, and then a little bit later by GPS surveys. Now we're using INSAR to measure land subsidence, and it's a satellite-based technique. It's radar data. And essentially, the idea is that a satellite goes over the same area multiple times, 
It takes images of this area. We take two or more images and we process them together and it makes a change map and it's sensitive to vertical change. So we're uh, able to image uh, subsidence from space. Sometimes, uh, depending on the conditions, we can see anywhere from five millimeters of change, uh, 10 millimeters of change was more the resolution for the San Joaquin Valley uh, because it's very agriculturally active. And if you can imagine trying to image five millimeters of change in an agriculturally active area, you know, they till the land and things grow. Um, so we have a lot of uh, extra filtering to do with, with agricultural lands that makes the resolution not quite as good as in desert areas or urban areas, for instance. Uh, this lower image here is an extensometer. And uh, Poland, the guy on the original slide, the title slide, he built and designed something like 35 extensometers in the San Joaquin Valley. And we've gone back and refurbished some of those We've learned a couple of things since the 50s and 60s about how to measure aquifer system compaction using extensometers. So we made a few design upgrades and are now measuring uh, aquifer system compaction at four locations in the San Joaquin Valley uh, by retrofitting these 50-year-old um, extensometers. So a little subsidence history in the San Joaquin Valley. I showed you the original telephone pole with Joel Poland showing the 30 feet of subsidence. Well, this shows a map of where that subsidence occurred. So here is the Delta Mendota Canal here, and here's the California Aqueduct. And brown areas indicate where there was subsidence between 1926 and 1970. And you can see the darker areas here uh, are near the California aqueduct. Well, that was kind of the case until about 1970. So a lot of subsidence. Here's compaction down here. So there's compaction, which is a component of subsidence. And here you can see groundwater levels declining. Well, you can see a turnaround in 1970 where water levels start to recover. At the same time, you see subsidence start to cease. It slowed down and then it ceased. And this is because the California aqueduct was put online. It started to deliver water in 1970 and started to bring water to farmers down here. And so we saw a, an abatement of, of subsidence, essentially, because now they didn't have to pump as much groundwater. Instead, they were using uh, water from the California aqueduct. So this is about the location here where this graph is. And so these, this recovery occurred until a drought. So now, because there wasn't enough water coming down the California aqueduct, the groundwater uh, use was increased to make up for that deficit coming down the aqueduct. You could see subsidence was reinitiated. And then, and this is, you know, uh, about 150 feet of water level decline in, in just a couple of years. Uh, really, that happened during the first year. Uh, after the drought, California aqueduct deliveries went back to what they were or similar to, and groundwater levels again recovered. And you could see subsidence stopped until the next drought in the late 80s. Okay, so, and then we saw subsidence reinitiate. So essentially, we found that uh, in areas of historical subsidence, that the problem was essentially arrested except for during droughts because less water was coming down the canal and groundwater pumping was increased to make up for that deficit. So the next, uh, so what I'm gonna show you now is th the location of this red circle is now where we're seeing the subsidence recently. The next slide I'm gonna show you is at this location of the star in the southern part of this red circle here. So when we started to come into a new drought in the late 2000s, so 2007 to 2009, people were concerned again uh, about subsidence on the west side because that's when we had seen it before, essentially abated except for during droughts. So there was concern during that drought and now, of course, uh, during the current drought. Because there's reduced surface water importation, the reliance on groundwater resources increases and groundwater levels declined. As it turns out, subsidence is not just a problem during droughts as it has been in the past uh, because we are starting to use land in a different way. 
And so where there isn't any access to surface water, whether it's the wettest year on record or a drought, um, they pump pretty much the same all the time, regardless of climatic conditions. So, uh, so it's not just a problem during droughts for some areas that don't have any access to surface water. So this graph is in this location I showed you in the last slide. This red is a continuous GPS site near Mendota. And you can see that it was pretty flat until 2007 during the drought, and we had some subsidence. And then from 2010 to 12, it essentially flattened out. It was still subsiding a little bit, but a greatly reduced rate. And then uh, during the latest drought, we can see that subsidence has reinitiated. At the same time here, we're looking at groundwater levels. This is in a deep well. And we could see that groundwater levels were recovering, but then in the last drought, 2007 to nine, and actually I have it to 2010 here, by the way, just because um, sort of that last year of the drought, because our reservoirs were so depleted, there still wasn't a lot of surface water coming down the aqueduct because we we're using it to refill the reservoirs. That's why you see it a little bit later here. Um, but in any case, you can see groundwater levels declined. And in the last drought in 2009, they actually got below the previous historic lowest level, which is the pre-consolidation stress. Um, and that was set during the last year of the previous drought in 1992. So that was the previous lowest groundwater level. It was about 155 feet or so. And we saw in 2009 that we went deeper than that and again in 2013. As I mentioned, one of the main reasons that we care about subsidence is because it's impact to infrastructure. And so this, this uh, map shows uh, in California where this, here's the inset, and the impacted area is right here in this red circle. And you can see that the California aqueduct is on the edge of that, the Delta Mendota Canal is in there, there's the east side bypass, other local canals, and also the San Joaquin River uh, in the restoration area. So there's a lot of infrastructure in, in this um, new subsidence area. So here's the data that, that we have from INSAR. So this is that radar satellite technique uh, that's very sensitive. As I said, I think we got down to about 10 millimeters of resolution here. And, um, and our focus was the Delta Mendota Canal, and it's here in red. And so we had to choose our data um, to make sure to cover the Delta Mendota Canal and be efficient at the same time. And so we could see here that, wow, most of the, the Delta Mendota Canal looks pretty stable. You know, these are kind of blues and yellows, some subsidence a little bit, um, but relatively stable until you start to get to the lower uh, stretches of this canal. And you can start to see um, some yellows and greens come in here on the edge, and, and then on the southern scene too, which is what we call a radar data collection, a radar scene, we could see we were on the edge of something, but our focus was the Delta Mendota Canal. On this northern image here, uh, these are slightly different time periods. So this northern image is from 2007 to 2010, so it captured most of the drought. We could see about three inches, but it was near the east side bypass and near the edge of our data and kind of far from the Delta Mendota Canal. Uh, and then with this scene, we could see that, again, the maximum, this is a different time period, or 2003 to 2008, and we see about six inches during that time, again, kind of on the edge of our data uh, and right next to the east side bypass. And so it looked like we were on the edge of something big, but we had limited resources, and so, um, so we focused on the Delta Mendota Canal uh, for that time being. And here's the results that we found. So this is a graph of subsidence, and I apologize for the numbers being so small, uh, but this is a zero line here, and down here is about 40 millimeters or so. Uh, so for this three-year period, 2007 to 2010, we could see that there's some subsidence here in the upper stretches. These are check stations. So these are all marked here, check stations, one through 21. And it looks like check stations one through, oh, about 10 or so are, you know, fairly stable. I mean, what really gets your attention is between check stations 16 and 17, pretty, a lot of subsidence between those. 
Um, and then here between 17 and 18, and here we are down here, there's a lot of differential subsidence here between 17 and 18, a lot of differential subsidence between 16 and 17, and also between 20 and 21. Those are where we figured there might be some problems on the canal based on this data. Uh, more or less fortunately, checks 18, 19, and 20 are subsiding about the same, so they're more or less maintaining gradients in that area. Um, so that is sort of good news um, for the Delta Mendota Water Authority and the Bureau of Reclamation. However, just about a month ago, I got a call from the Delta Mendota Water Authority saying that they were having problems pushing water past check seven. And as I mentioned before, canals are very sensitive to subsidence, such that you need you know, elevation and gradients maintained between the check stations uh, so that the canal can flow uh, and deliver water as designed. But just this little bit of subsidence upstream, so water comes from Tracy up here and goes down to the Mendota pool at the end, water is flowing down here and they're having a hard time getting it past this uh, check station here because it had to essentially go uphill, that gradient was disrupted. This was not where their problems were, where the large amounts of subsidence were. They had problems uh, pushing past check seven. And so a very short-lived opportunity to try to uh, fill up San Luis res Reservoir somewhat, which is right here, uh, was missed because they couldn't, the, the capacity was impacted at check seven and it's kind of like a, a chain, a one broken link is, is where your problem is. So they couldn't push as much water pack, past check seven as they wanted to. This is a, a result of a flow model, the Central Valley Hydrologic Model uh, by Font and others, and it's published and we're now updating it. This blue line is the design elevation of the Delta Mendota Canal and the red is subsidence from 61 to 2003. And you can see this is where they're having problems because that gradient flattened out. So this is where they're having the biggest problems. But you can see here the subsidence between checks uh, one and seven or so, and then a little bit to check 13. And then uh, down here, as I mentioned, between checks uh, 18, 19, and 20, they're pretty much the same subsidence maintaining the gradient, so we don't expect the canal to have problems in those areas. Well, we couldn't uh, help but look to the east a little bit after we got a call from the Department of Water Resources, who were doing, had a consultant do a, a GPS survey in this area right here. And they couldn't believe the results of their, their surveys. They did them two years apart in 2008 and in 2010, and we're finding remarkable differences in elevations between those two times at the same benchmarks, the same monuments that they were surveying. So, um, and we knew we were on the edge of something when we were looking at the Delta Mendota Canal, so we thought that we better do some quick, and, uh, some quick work to see if we could confirm their survey results. And not only did we confirm their results, but we found this very large subsidence area um, that was covering 1,200 square miles. Their, their survey was in this little area here. And so we not only confirmed uh, that they were seeing about a foot a year of subsidence uh, between 2008 and 2010, but essentially the subsidence bowl went all the way from I-5 to 99. And I know this image doesn't go all the way to I-5, um, but the other data I showed you before showed that this is starting to impact that far west. And this is impacting the Delta Mendota Canal. Um, so we did not expect to find subsidence here. This is right in between the east side bypass and the San Joaquin River, which is really not a great place uh, for that magnitude uh, rate of subsidence to occur, uh, being right next to waterways. As I mentioned, the east side bypass is the most important flood control channel east of the San Joaquin River. Uh, and that's severely impacted by subsidence here. I'm going to show you a close-up of this box. So here I've contoured the INSAR image. 
so that you can see a little bit closer and don't have to try to interpret the colors. And so here again is the east side bypass. You can see it just faded through there and the San Joaquin River. Um, and now I'm going to show you um, what a profile down the east side bypass looks like. So uh, water would generally flow uh, from A prime to A uh, on its way to the, um, to the delta and out, right? So this is flood control. So I'm going to uh, show you this uh, profile. And as you can see, as water is flowing down, there's a little hole there. So more subsidence here than at these two locations. And then this very large, um, essentially, uh, depression in the east side bypass where when flood uh, flows occur and the east side bypass is used, it's going to have to fill this area up and, and before it starts continue flowing down the canal. So it's going to flood this and it's going to flood all points at lower elevation than it. Um, so, um, so the east side bypass is, is certainly impacted by subsidence and it will not be able to move water out uh, like it used to be able to. The next slide I'm going to show you is at this location here. And this shows how uh, the rate of subsidence uh, changed. It doubled in 2008. So here we start at zero um, displacement or subsidence because that's our first data point. And we can see between 2003 and 2004, there was about 40 or 45 millimeters of subsidence. And then it kind of flattened out 2004 to 2005, not particularly dry years. Uh, and then we have this data gap here, so we just assumed no change. Um, there could have been change, but we don't have data, so uh, we assumed no change. And then you can see between 2005 and 2007, we have a few data points. And then, and then we get to 2010, and we can see that the, the slope of these lines are much different. This slope is about twice the slope. So the rate doubled in uh, 2008. And uh, as I mentioned in the summary slide, this rate of subsidence has continued through 2013. So we're looking at about a foot a year of subsidence since 2008. We also looked at GPS measurements in the area. And um, naturally, we didn't have any GPS uh, sites right in the areas that we wanted them. Uh, they are sort of surrounding this, this area of subsidence that's shown by the contours here. And so we're looking at um, a site here, P307 in Madeira and a site over here near Los Banos, and a site down here near Mendota. And they all show something different. So P303 up here by Los Banos was subsiding a little bit, and then the drought came, and you can see that rate increases. Here, uh, during the um, sort of inter-drought period, you can see that it, it's still subsiding, but it slowed down a little bit. And then during the latest drought, uh, we have uh, additional subsidence at a greater rate than during the, the inter-drought inter period. Down here by Mendota, you can see here it was really quite flat until 2007. And then during the drought, we had subsidence. And then it essentially flattened out again, a little bit of subsidence going on there, but fairly flat. And then uh, in the next drought, we see uh, subsidence kick in again. Over here in Madeira, we see it's pretty steady rate uh, during droughts and in between droughts, uh, with slight increases during droughts, increases in the rates. And this shows us something interesting. So we notice that these two, P303 and 307, have, have subsidence even when there isn't drought. And down here by P304, we really only see subsidence during drought. And that's a reflection of access to surface water. So at P303, very little access to surface water. So it doesn't matter how much is coming down the California Aqueduct or the Delta Mendota Canal, they have to pump the same because they don't have access to that water. It's the same with P307 over here in Madeira, where they don't have access to a lot of surface water. So it really doesn't matter how much is being delivered to anyone else. They still have to pump the same. Whereas P304, this is the end of the Delta Mendota Canal. This is where the uh, Mendota Pool is. 
And so they do have access to surface water supplies, and that's why you see uh, droughts only during periods when their uh, access to surface water is reduced, or the volume of water of surface of volume of surface water that they're receiving is reduced. So this is a map that shows where the historical subsidence was, and Joe Poland was standing around here, and, and here's where we're mapping it now. Now there's a red circle on here, notice, and we also know that uh, additional subsidence is occurring down here. Uh, we have just started looking at this in the past couple of weeks or so, um, so we expect to have some new results for subsidence in the southern area here. Uh, within the next few months or so. So just to go back and forth one more time, there's where the historical subsidence is, there's where the recent subsidence is, and notice the Delta Mendota Canal is right between these two areas. So before, historically it was being impacted from subsidence that was occurring to the south, and more recently it's being impacted by subsidence occurring to the north. These are some other results from the Central Valley hydrologic model. And here are results that are published through 2003. As I mentioned, we're updating it uh, to 2009, and some aspects we're updating to 2013. Uh, but we can see here that at the end of 2003, there's not very much subsidence in this area. But by 2009, it really uh, shows up in the model data and that's exactly what we found. Uh, this is the this sort of uh, Madeira subsidence area that I've been talking about. So the model uh, results actually predicted that subsidence would occur in the location that we're measuring it. This is a, a just a, a cartoon cross section of the San Joaquin Valley, and the main part that I want to point out is that there's an unconfined aquifer system. There's a corker and clay confining layer. So this very clay-rich unit was laid down uh, by an ancient lake. And then that confines this aquifer system down here. So this is a pressurized aquifer system, a confined aquifer system. And so now I'm going to show you some information about the unconfined and the confined aquifer system in terms of groundwater levels and compaction. So in Mendota, we have that, uh, that same GPS site that I showed you before that's essentially flat except for during droughts. And then nearby, there's an extensometer. And it is anchored in the top of the corker and clay. So it's essentially measuring the aquifer system compaction from land surface to the top of the corker and clay, which at this location is about 400 feet below land surface. And we can see that the Fordell extensometer is measuring a little bit of compaction, but you can see that the GPS station is measuring a whole lot more. Because this is anchored in the top of the Corcoran clay, this shows us how much subsidence is happening or how much compaction is happening in the upper 400 feet. And theoretically, this GPS station goes all the way to the center of the earth. What this tells us is that most of the compaction is happening below the top of the corker and clay. Some is happening in that unconfined system, but it looks like most of it is happening beneath the unconfined system. Another piece of evidence that most compaction is occurring in the deeper system is uh, this site near Los Banos. So this was another GPS station that we looked at near Los Banos, and here is a water level in a shallow well. You can see that the water level in the shallow well has hardly changed at all, while subsidence has uh, occurred at P303. So what that's telling us is that the, the stress that's driving this compaction is not occurring in the shallow system. So it looks like most of the compaction in the Mendota area and in the Los Banos area is happening beneath the top of the Corcoran clay. Um, and I'll get to some uh, interesting caveats about that statement here in just a minute. So what is, is causing these high subsidence rates? Well, it's two things, and I mentioned this in one of the very first slides, that we need to have groundwater level declines. We need to really have what groundwater level declines that are going below the historical lows. And we also need clay units. Um, so two things, groundwater level declines, 
and geology. We need both of those things for subsidence to occur. And in this new area, this Madeira subsidence bowl, as we call it, it's kind of near um, a town of, called El Nido, uh, the geologic setting is a little bit different in this location than a lot of other locations around the San Joaquin Valley. Um, not only do we have the, the fine gray units below the Corcoran that we think are responsible for most of the subsidence, um, a lot of people think that it's probably the Corcoran clay is the big player in subsidence, but it's really not. Um, it's so tight hydrologically that it, it drains very, very slowly. So even as it's being squeezed, even as those particles are rearranging ever so slightly, it is really slow to respond. So the Corcoran clay is not a big problem for us now. Um, but we will probably shake our fists at it uh, in 5,000 years and wonder why we didn't do anything about it um, today. So it's very slow to respond. It does have a lot of compaction uh, potential in it, but it won't be realized for, for quite some time. Um, so in any case, be, besides these Corcoran clay, this, these sub-Corcoran clay fine grain units, and these are discontinuous lenses of clay. Um, in this area of Ma the Madeira subsidence bowl, we also have a couple of interesting alluvial fans, the Chowchilla River and the Fresno River fan. So first I'm gonna show you some water level declines and then I'll explain uh, what's different about the geologic setting in this area. Again, here's the same cross section that we saw before unconfined with the Corcoran clay confining this lower system. And here what we see is this top graph is groundwater levels in the shallow system above the Corcoran clay. And the two uh, graphs on the bottom are groundwater levels in the sub-Corcoran or in the deep system. As we can see in this shallow system that this black, these black lines represent the historic lows. In the shallow system they are reached in in that last big drought, the late 80s to early 90s. They didn't get there during my study period. This ends in 2010. So the shallow system really stayed above historical lows. However, the deep system did not. The deep system reached historical lows, as you can see here. So what that tells us is that compaction that occurred in the deep system is permanent. The preconsolidation stress was surpassed. In the shallow system, while there may have been some compaction going on up there, it's probably recoverable because it wasn't below that preconsolidation stress. And what we see recently is that groundwater levels continue to decline. So our study ended in 2010, um, but we're certainly not out of the woods. We saw historic lows being reached last summer. Uh, in this well, and uh, we have it instrumented with the uh, submersible pressure transducer, and we anticipate that we will uh, reach new historic lows this summer. Now to the geology. So we, we, as part of the Central Valley hydrologic model, we digitized about 8,500 well logs, um, and this is just a visualization of that, where clay is blue and um, yellow and reds are gravel. So you could see a lot of clay in this area. Um, and so we digitized well logs to get a, a handle on the geologic setting and the variability throughout the San Joaquin Valley and actually the Central Valley as a whole. And uh, we put all of that into a database and um, came up with the sediment texture uh, for each of the layers in the model. And uh, although this is the top layer here, it really does represent um, what happens throughout the system as you get deeper. That this is, this is finer grain than the surrounding areas, and this is exactly where we're finding this new subsidence area. So you can see a lot of warmer colors out here. It's more coarse grain material. These bluer colors are more fine grain, and they're kind of shallow. So what we found is that you could almost map the subsidence area by mapping the location of these fans. So here's the Fresno River fan and the Chowchilla River fan. I will color those in. And they are different texture-wise than the fans around them, the north or the south. And they're different because they were never connected to Sierra Nevada glaciations. 
So they have finer grain deposits because they never had those big pulses of, of glacier, glacial till coming down those rivers. So they didn't have the big pulses of that coarse grain material coming down these rivers uh, or down these fans that are in between the San Joaquin River and the Merced River. Those were connected to glaciation. But you see in the red circle where the Chowchilla River fan and the Fresno River fans are located, uh, they were not um, part of that glaciation, so they're finer grained. So that said, there may be uh, quite a lot of potential in the unconfined system to compact and subside. So uh, we don't really have the instrumentation in place to know how this is working yet. We need extensometers in this area uh, that are shallow so that we can differentiate what's happening in the shallow system compared to the deep system. So while most of the places we looked and Dr. Pullen found the same results that, that looked like most of the compaction was happening in the deep system, this new area of subsidence has the potential to um, have some issues in the shallow system too. Now traditionally, the shallow system hasn't been used much uh, for groundwater pumping and, and irrigating crops. And the reason is because it has poor groundwater quality. So most of the pumping has been from the deeper system. But as subsidence is occurring there, uh, farmers and others are looking for solutions to subsidence and starting to exercise and use that shallow, unconfined system more than it's been used before. So, uh, so the impacts of that until we get instrumentation in place will really be unknown if the, most of the compaction occurs to happen in the deep system or if we start to see some in the shallow system. So it's a really interesting area for um, further research and um, we're looking forward to doing that. Um, so the online resources here uh, are shown. We have hydrologic information for California at the uh, California Water Science Center. We have a website that is uh, just focused on hydrolo hydrologic studies in the Central Valley, that's, that's that second. And then we also have quite a lot of drought information for California at the California Water Science Center website. Thank you.